subject to responsible conduct of research, and we're going to touch just very briefly on all nine of them. I'm going to touch on the first three and kind of in collaborative science, and we're going to touch on the rest of them. Okay. So advising and mentoring. Um, who here are undergraduate students? Okay, so we're all graduate level students. Have we all chosen a mentor? Has anybody chosen a mentor? Has, does anybody have a mentor? Um, how many do you have? Um, One or more, two? Yeah, about two. Two? two and, and how did you choose these mentors? Um, based on experience, uh, pretty much what's in the experience, ability, um, her willingness to uh, help us improve, mm -hmm. Uh, those, those attributes and being an expert um, in the field. Okay. And does anybody know the difference between, if there is, and if there is a difference between advisor and a mentor? What, what do we think? Is there a difference or are they the same? I think that uh, advisor, I think that a mentor becomes all of I always put on the corner where I receive my information, where I get my information from, right? For all well, we all know the reasons for that. But they say that based on a, a National Academy of Sciences, a mentor's experience within the research and challenges that trainees face, uh, they are able and willing to communicate that experience and have an interest in helping another person develop into a successful professional, right? And acclimate this person acclimates young researchers into the research community. Now, the uh, distinguishing factor is that a mentor can be an advisor, right? But an advisor usually does not mentor, okay? So when they say of a mentor that is being an advisor, teacher, role model, and friend, okay? All of that, the professional, social, um, all of those aspects go into that relationship, right? And it's usually for the long haul as opposed to just an advisor as, you say, advising on the courses to take, advising on the courses that I need to take to graduate, advising on the courses that I should take to get into this field, okay? Mentor is a little bit more complex and uh, more of a relationship as opposed to um, advisor, advisee, okay? Um, That's the word I'm looking for, relationship. Relationship, okay. I like the difference. You know, I think that sometimes you can be. Okay. I think that we're using the council grad school definition of mental mm -hmm. Okay, and with that though, there's responsibilities on each side, right? As a student, your responsibility is to identify your career plans gather a diverse collection of mentors, like the individual back there who has two, right? Um, seek out and initiate rapport with mentors, effective communication, and learn about the mentoring process. Where students should not be passive in this relationship, okay, in the development of this relationship. They should be as engaged and aggressive as the, as the mentor will be, right? They need to, uh, students should identify what it is that they want to get out of the relationship and what their future plans are or would like to be, right? Have an idea of that so that the mentor can help you. The mentor has no idea what your future uh, in, uh, aspirations are. They're not going to be able to, to guide you and mentor you in, uh, the way they should. So it's effective communication. Okay? Be aggressive, um, uh, professionally aggressive, of course. <laughs> um, and let the, let the mentor know what um, you expect of them early in the, in the relationship. right? Um, and then it says seek out initiate rapport with mentors. When I was a graduate student, I had multiple mentors for different reasons, right? For my uh, thesis committee, I made sure that I had to have a female on my committee. I didn't want, I felt more comfortable with at least one female because an all-male committee with myself, I didn't know if I was going to have 
uh, any, um, if I was going to be able to contribute to anything, or, was, or were they just going to tell me what to do, right? I felt maybe a feminine touch would would help. And that's just my own opinion. That was my own opinion based off of my experiences, right? He may be a little different. It may be based off of race or ethnicity or even culture issues, right? Um, if you find someone within your department or on campus that has the same culture, they may be able to, to talk with you and discuss with you some things to look for, okay? The differences between the American culture and what culture uh, you may be, right? Uh, so that type of uh, relationship can go into mentoring, but you have to do your part and not be passive, okay? As well as um, expertise level, right? Uh, I was a peptide biochemist, but at the same time, I had a neuroscientist on my committee. Why? Because I'm, I'm focusing on peptide biochemistry within the brain, right? Um, I didn't specifically need a neuroscientist, but I felt that that aspect would be critical in my research, right? So take into account all types of reasons why you would want to bring in a mentor. And if any questions, please just stop me anytime. Um, but yet, as the mentor, they often have influence over the mentee uh, through the allocation of credit, publication practices, um, proper divisions of responsibility. So both the mentor and the mentee will have uh, their responsibility to have to, to provide clear expectations at the beginning of the at the beginning of this relationship and throughout. Um, let it be known that students, when you're conducting your research, you are not slaves to the mentor. Okay, you're not there just pounding out data and getting nothing out of it. Okay, there is a there is a way that you can conduct your research and just do nothing but gather and obtain data and get nothing. There, you won't flourish as as a researcher because all you're doing is just collecting data, right? There needs to be more in that in, in that relationship. Okay. Uh, as far as publication practices, what are what is going to be your expectation when you provide a certain amount of input into the research, right? And the and the and the manuscript is developed. Okay, are you going to be an author? Are you going to be first author? Are you going to be second or third? Are you going to be an acknowledgement? Let's go ahead and have that conversation early enough. Okay, and this you'll be able to get an idea of is this the person that you would want to mentor you, right? Because in the end, you're learning. As you are being a mentor, you are learning how to mentor, right? And coming up with your own approach to how you would mentor the next student, right? Okay, so this is just a dynamic evolving process and it's both mentor and mentee that should be involved. Okay, so uh, treatment of data. Um, good data management is designing studies that create meaningful and unbiased data, does not waste resources, and protects human and animal subjects. Um, even if you don't use human or animal subjects, you still uh, need to design a study that is meaningful and unbiased. Okay, you don't want to waste resources, and in this climate, you don't have the luxury of uh, wasting resources. Because I know on this campus we we use everything, <laughs> we use everything, and we don't have the opportunity to continue getting new material and new resources in, right? So you want to make sure that you can you conduct your experiments and you design them in a way that they'll be productive. Okay? You want uh, the treatment of that to be accurate, accessible, and a permanent record. So uh, treatment of data. These are some of the issues that you are going to have to discuss and um, think about uh, throughout the life of the project, right? Acquisition of data, right? How are you going to select your data? How much data should be collected and your collection method, right? Um, we had a student come in, uh, talk about their research when they had an N of two, right? Their whole uh, research thesis was based off of N of two. That may be okay. That may not be okay, right? You need to have that discussion beforehand so that when you're getting ready to publish or when you're getting ready to defend your research, you're not standing there with an N of two and people are laughing at you. N of two is not going to be enough, right? So 
have that, think about that before you uh, begin your research. Um, the management of that, how are you gonna store and protect it, right? This is um, uh, important and confidentiality, which is what you talked about, <coughs> right? This is gonna be very important if there's gonna be collaborations with uh, for-profit or research outside of East Carolina, <coughs> right? If you get into an agreement, a research collaboration, right? Uh, and there's restrictions on publications, or there's restrictions on what can be published, or I just said that, but what uh, can be and cannot be discussed, for, for instance, proprietary information, right? Uh, you gotta know what you can and cannot publish, what you can and cannot disclose. Uh, specifically when, if you plan to do research with the federal government or the military, the, uh, the the Army, the Navy, they have very strict agreements in what can and cannot be disclosed to the public. And this means pre publication in this just or verbally, right? You want to make sure you know uh, what your restrictions are, if there are any, right? Confidentiality is when it uh, goes to intellectual property. You have a potential uh, patent, right? Uh, how much can you disclose and when? Right? Because once you disclose something that is patentable, or what you consider as patentable, patentable, you have one year from that date to uh, file a patent application at the uh, USPTO. University. The USPTO. Right? So you want to have this discussion. You want to think about that when you get when you have your collector data. Right? The availability, the integrity, the retention and disposal. Some data, if you're working with human research. Uh, uh, human uh, doing research on humans, there may be uh, requirements on how long you have to hold on to that data. Is, is there not federal regulations on that, right? Uh, no one will touch upon that, right? You can't just get collect your data, write your paper, or defend your research and then throw away that data. Specifically, if you get certain types of protected, uh, identifiable information. Okay, so know what your samples are and what you can and cannot do with that data. Does that include surveys? That includes uh, c certain types of surveys, right. right? Depending on what the information you're collecting. Oh, collecting the personal information. Oh yeah, you, you want to make sure that you know how long you can keep it and how you're going to dispose of that. Okay, you can't just throw it away, right? Um, so no one's going to touch up on that. Okay. And you have to identify this. I'll help you with that. So yeah, uh, my suggestion would be to talk to Norman before you begin your research, right? <laughs> because we had a we had a, a, a horrible situation where students were conducting research, got collecting human uh, identifiable information, um, protected identifiable information, and it didn't go to the IRB. They lost all of that data, did they not? Yes. All of their data. You don't. You can't get that time back. I have a drawer full of data that I've collected. <laughs> that wasn't my data, it was their data. Right. When she, and if you, you can't get it back. Okay. So uh, that goes into the management and then the analysis of your data. How, what statistical analysis are you going to use? Um, talk about that, you know, we have statisticians who consult and help students graduate students, researchers with their data and how to analyze your data statistically, right? Um, really engage and uh, use the resources that you have right here on campus. You pay for it in your tuition, right? Um, publication and reporting analysis, right? That's gonna be important when, you, when we talk about our data. Okay. Uh, conflict of interest uh, is any financial or other personal interest that compromise, have the potential to compromise, or have the appearance of compromising, um, let's take that employee objectivity out, but put in student objectivity in, in our case, okay? Um, this is gonna, this is very important because we want the public to maintain trust in the research that we are that we are disseminating to the public, right? The research that we that we conduct, um, we want the public to believe in your research, correct? Why bother doing it and why bother publishing it if nobody's going to take it um, for take take it for seriously, right? Um, so that's very important. Um, and it's not just financial interests; it's any type of personal interest. Um, 
if your mentor, for instance, uh, is working or collaborating with a for-profit, right, and they're very, they have a very good relationship <coughs> with that for-profit, the mentor speaks highly of it, right, and it's almost as if any kind of data your mentor wants you to provide positive data so that it can help that corporation. What are you going to do? You're a student, right? Are you going to be, are you going to feel uh, like you should change that data or manipulate that data in a way to um, make your mentor happy because of that relationship, right? It's, it's, re it's remote, but yet it's something that can affect your objectivity. And that's what we don't want. However, the good thing is it's realistic to have to have interests, to have um, diverse interests, and it's reality that some of them may conflict. If there is a uh, situation where your uh, interests may conflict, come talk to me, and we'll sit down and we will mitigate those conflicts. We will, I will review them, okay, and we'll come up with a management plan. Okay, maybe you need to disclose, right? Maybe you need to have extra layer of oversight, okay? Um, all potential conflicts of interest require disclosure to prevent the appearance of impropriety, financial conflict of interest, and other external commitments are not necessarily prohibited and may be situational reality that cannot be avoided. Okay. And this is important because now uh, in the with this research, um, who cares? The government cares, okay? The government feels that any type of funding from the government uh, may be affected the research that comes from federally funded awards is affected due to your interest they want to know and they're going to take that money away right or they're going to put down have some sort of a punishment or some sort of sanction because they want objective research you do not want any bias right and if there is bias like i said conflict of interest is, is sometimes it's reality right they want to make sure that it's been managed and that what we disclose, what we uh, um, provide to the public is really objective research, okay? Uh, your sponsors care, competitors at peer institutions, ECU and our board of trustees, as, and most importantly, public supporters and the media. Because once the media gets on that ECU researchers are not objective in their research, they're going to pounce on that story, right? And it's going to affect uh, any other type of funding that may potentially come to ECU, okay? And the one thing that we all don't want is to have our objectivity questioned, correct? Uh, research misconduct uh, based on uh, the U.S. Office of Science and Technology Policy. Uh, it is fabrication, falsification, plagiarism. Sometimes we use fabrication and falsification uh, interchangeably, but fabrication is just coming up with that, just out of, just out of the air, right? And then your falsification is taking a, taking data that you have obtained and uh, manipulating it or changing or omitting data, right? Uh, that is not accurately reflected in the research record. And then plagiarism, we all know what plagiarism is, right? Appropriation of another person's ideas, processes, results, or words without giving appropriate credit. Plagiarism is not good in the classroom and is not good in your research. Okay? Okay. Criteria considered misconduct, significant departure from accepted practices and norms in that discipline. I made sure to put that discipline or that in bold, right? Because we're all different here. Uh, significant departure um, may not be consistent with all areas, right? But if you go outside of what is accepted in sociology or in construction management, right? Um, that's going to be considered misconduct. Um, any kind of misconduct that's committed intentionally, knowingly, or recklessly, those three words, basically, you knew that it was wrong and you did it anyway, okay? Um, and proven by preponderance of evidence, that just means that if it's 51% chance that you did uh, engage in misconduct, then more than likely you have misconduct, recent misconduct. Okay? Um, and it does not include honest error, differences of opinion, or issues of authorship. <coughs> okay. what do I have? Um, some of the outcomes and corrective actions uh, for misconduct are sanctions, 
corrections under retraction in publications, dismissal, return of sponsored funds, um, debarment from the Office of Research Integrity, that is a federal agency, right? Civil action, which is not good, you're gonna be sued, uh, or a loss of degree in career. Here at East Carolina, we take uh, scientific misconduct, research misconduct very seriously. If there is any kind of allegation, um, I'm going to be the one to investigate. Right? And I'm going to get everything to make sure that I come up with, we come up with um, whether the allegation is, is forthright or not. Okay? But this is, we take it very seriously. Um, and these are some of the uh, outcomes that can come out of it. Okay. And I think this is my last one. Collaborative science. Um, benefits of collaborations are complementary expertise, saves time, reduces expenses, uh, innovative approaches to solving problems, funding sources, and encourage collaborative projects. So this is to say that we encourage collaborations in this time, in this economy. Uh, it is in your best interest to collaborate, and it's, it's good to collaborate over multiple disciplines, right? So that way one research project can have so many different uh, um, results that come out of it that can touch on those disciplines, right? Um, I remember when I was uh, a was a grad student, I collaborated with two different laboratories, right? Because they had specific pieces of equipment that my lab didn't have, right? That made my thesis that much more robust, right? Uh, and not only that, I went to state a few times, North Carolina State, yes. Um, I went to say to collaborate because they had a piece of equipment that ECU did not have. That also uh, uh, strengthened the collaboration between East Carolina and state, right? Um, saves time, reduces expenses, and I came up with so many more different avenues to take my research because of that, because of that collaborative um, space, right? <coughs> okay. But with any kind of, kind of collaboration, you want to make sure that you set ground rules early, right? You want to discuss authorship in advance, share resources, um, including data, results, and ownership. Leadership should be established. You want to talk about the goal of your research, right? Um, and as your collaboration concludes, uh, you want to talk about the allocation of credit. And this is going to be important because you don't know this. Every researcher has their own style. Right? Every researcher has their own personality. You may uh, get into a relationship or have a collaboration where things fall off. Okay? So what's going to happen with the data that's been obtained? Right? Who's got ownership of that? Can you share that data after the collaboration is over, after it's concluded? Right? Who's going to be author, first author, second author? Right? And biomedical research, your first author is pretty much king. Right? Um, first, and then that very last author. That's pretty much who people look at. In other uh, disciplines, it may be different. And there just may be one author. So what's going to happen when you're doing a collaboration? Who's going to be in the acknowledgement section, right? You want to have that discussion early on, right? And then continue to have that conversation as, as, the, as the research progresses. Okay. And, and that's me. And I'll let Nolan speak. Okay. Let's start with questions. Do you have lunch? I bought some uh, handouts. I've learned long ago that if you want them, you can take them. If you don't, I'll take them home and pass them out the next time. My name is Norma Epley. I am the director of the Office for Research Integrity and Compliance. I've been here five years, and this is our third name. Only because the office keeps growing. Uh, our primary responsibility is human research. I have a HIPAA analyst, which is your protected health information. And Hiromi has just now joined the office, and so she has all of her wonderful areas of compliance now under that same umbrella. Tonight I'm going to talk about mostly human, using humans and animals in research. And so since the question started about humans, I'll start there. Actually, there is probably, um, I wouldn't say more regulations, but, but more attention right now on human research, using humans in research. 
only because it's the last headline that brings attention. That's the way it always is. There's nothing gets done at a stop sign until somebody gets killed and then you get a stoplight. Well, it's the same way with the regulations. It's a knee-jerk kind of reaction. What our office does is try to help you avoid that knee-jerk reaction. We have taken a lot of time and effort on combining into one application all of the regulations that apply to human research. Our system is called ePirate, and if I had any clue how to get it pulled up, I would show you, but it's under www.ecu.edu ecu.edu forward slash IRB. Yes. www.ecu.edu forward slash IRB. She's just going to make me feel. I was just finishing an application this afternoon. If you, I just had an ECU IRB. Did it come out of my brain? I don't have the words. It, it did. It, That's right. wonderful to know. All right. Look at this big purple button down here. We made it as big as they would let us on one page. That's where you actually go in. You have to register within ePirate. And what that means is you go in, you set up a profile. You tell us who you are what your role will be, and you all may be uh, principal investigators, or you may be study personnel. It just depends on whatever the role is that you and um, your faculty mentor have decided. Some faculty like for you to be your own PI. Some want to be the PI and have you listed otherwise. At any rate, you set up your profile, you, you tell us what your role is, and then it comes back to us and we verify that you are who you say you are and that you have the roles. You know, if you put yourself in as department approver, we may have a question or two for you. But, but most people do it right, and then we will send you back within usually a couple of hours an email that says, okay, go ahead and submit. How long did it take you to get your okay to enter? You know, Frank, it's, um, I completed my, um, completed, I had an exam study. No, I mean, it was very quick, but um, I um, I didn't wait for, I saved all my information, yeah. and I think I could have submitted right then, but I didn't submit until about seven hours later. So I'm not sure, I think I got it. It all went so seamlessly. I like hearing you. Yes. So, spoken from the mouth of someone who is unbiased, because I gave two years of my life to get the system up and running. Um, it is called a smart form. It's not as smart as I had hoped it would be, but we finally have a graduate assistant from the College of Computer Technology, whatever it's called, who is now helping us. And what that means is, if you're using children and he's not in his research, you're going to see a set of questions about the use of children in your research that you're not going to see. It, it's based on the, some of the very, very preliminary answers you give as to where it branches and what questions you see. So that's how you get in. There are all kinds of important things up here along this left-hand side. The very first, of course, is the electronic system. Uh, the news is not so new. Uh, we have been so busy that I thought they were going to take that down, but maybe they haven't. Office directory will get you to anyone in our office. Um, the committees, a lot of times if you're doing something with external funding agencies, they want to know who's sitting on the IRB that's going to review your research. So you can go right there and it will tell you the list of people who are serving on the IRB and uh, you can print it out, hand it to the external sponsor. All of our policies and procedures are on there. I will tell you that when I first came, 
it was all in one big manual with no tabs or, you know, you just had to search through the whole thing to find what you were looking for. It has been my project, <coughs> which I haven't gotten very far on, uh, to get that into separate documents so you only have to look at children. You can go straight to the policies and SOPs on children. It's about 30%, 40% done, but I've now uh, garnered some help with my two senior staff people and it's going a lot more quickly now. Uh, education. If you are doing human research protection, uh, no, if you're doing human research activities, you have to have human research protection training. And that's done through what's called the CITI modules. Um, it, you have a choice. <clears throat> if you're a behavioral or social scientist, you want to go through that set of modules. If you're um, biomedical or nursing doing some biomedical, then you want to go through that set of modules. It will take you about two and a half to three hours. Just warning you. <clears throat> No. And I, I can't say a whole lot about it because I'm a co-author on it, yeah. but I promise you, I do not like it being that long. Yes? Does that have to do with, with research yeah. on humans, like medical research, is that, or is that also interviewing or getting data? It's any human research. Okay. And maybe I ought to define what human research is, because somebody talked about a survey. <clears throat> Human research is any research in which there is private identifiable information collected either directly from an individual or about an individual. So if you're going in, um, who's in the construction? I thought someone was in construction. Okay, never mind. Let's just pretend. Hiromi has another one of her millions of degrees in construction management. <clears throat> if you're going in and you're asking construction bosses their preference to concrete mix and rebar, is that human research? No. Why? Because um, the, as long as you're not identifying well, if, if, you, if you're going to identify the community that you're asking about, then yes, it is. Good. It was a trick question. Very good. If you're just doing a survey and you're not going to record the company, the name of the, the manager, or anything like that, but just that person's preferences, that's not private identifiable information. So it's not human research. Now, it gets really tricky sometimes because people with external funding that want to give you money to do your research, even if it doesn't meet our definition, may ask you to provide them some kind of documentation that you are in fact exempt from our purview. So for us to give you that letter, we have to look at it. You know, so it's kind of this catch-22 thing. That doesn't mean it's the same thing as an exemption certification. I know it's confusing, but I didn't choose the terms the feds use. Exemption certification means that the research is about humans. You're either interacting with or having an intervention that is being used on humans, but it's minimal risk. And minimal risk is that risk which is no greater than what you would naturally have in your everyday life. It's usually things like surveys without identifiers. Um, you can ask a public elected official anything about anything and it will be exempt because they give all rights up to having private identifiable information. School children can be used in exemption if you're studying curriculum uh, or it's a classroom setting using normal classroom uh, practices. Something that I haven't seen here because this is a land grant institution, 
But in my home state of Kentucky, where I worked for many years, yay, go blue. Uh, we had a lot of taste testing because we raised a lot of beef. <coughs> and so they would do taste tests on beef that was raised on alfalfa versus beef that was raised on rye, and then, you know, you do your taste testing. So those were the categories for exemption certificates. The first case we were talking about, it's exempt from anything. You just bring us your research proposal, we'll look at it, we'll give you a letter that says this is in human research. Okay, now that was far more than I ever planned on telling you about exemptions, but. Can I, can I ask you? Sure. Yeah. Doing a case study where you are looking at, based for instance, for instance, five colleges, mm -hmm. and you're looking at the process, but you are also looking at leadership. How they choose their leadership, or how their leadership guides them? How their leadership forms. I think I'm talking myself into the answer. Uh, <laughs> I do that a lot. You have to communicate with that leader, which means I'm collecting information from the leader. But I don't necessarily have to identify that leader. Okay, the, the first question I would ask you would be, if a third party were to get hold of your research responses by whatever means, they break in your car and get the responses, would that place that leader at risk of employability, insurability, civil liability, criminal liability, psychological or emotional risk? It's all going to be positive information, but you, you, it, it would because you'll be able to connect, because I'm talking about this institution, and, and a leader with a question mark. And you can make, as long as you can make that connection that I need to be able to, and that's human. Yes. That makes it human, because I'm, I'm, you can look at the data and say, okay, that's Larry Johnson. Larry Johnson was that, so was it. Right. With the Chancellor of East Carolina in 2010, so, yeah. Okay. Yeah. And, and it is a very gray area. And I only would advise you to go through the IRB with that application as a protection to you in case something happens. <coughs> um, but there's plenty of research that goes on that, that doesn't need IRB review, clearly. There's a lot of surveys that are done now on Qualtrics. I, I don't know these things, you know, but they're all done supposedly without identifiers. But what people forget, people of my generation especially, is that IP addresses can be tracked back to an individual computer and if that person is pretty much the owner of that computer, that means that address can be tracked back. Now it's my understanding you can now do this in something that doesn't track the IP address. But if you were to come to me and say, should I go through the IRB as a graduate student, I would say yes. Um, if it was faculty where they had the whole university behind them, if something were to go horribly wrong, I wouldn't worry about it. But right now, we are your line of defense, and that's why I would encourage you to come through. Uh, animal research is, is really, on the other side of the spectrum right now, although, you know, something could happen in the lab tomorrow and all of a sudden all of the animal extremists, I like to call them, but whatever, would be up in arms and they'd be in Congress's face and they'd be letting animals loose in the forest and all kinds of things. The reason that it's a lot better protected is you can go ask people to take part in a study without ever coming through us and I probably won't know it. But you can't order animals without the people in the IACUC, which is Institutional Animal Care and Use Committee, without them knowing it. 
If you've got an animal on this campus, I can guarantee you somebody's going to say something to someone and it's going to get right back to the eye cook. They are responsible for the use of animals, vertebrate animals, um, starting with fish. Uh, they even, I think, incorporate uh, crustaceans now, all the way up through non-human primates, which is a big, big no-no if you can use any other model for your research. And as a matter of fact, I think the last non-human primates have been moved off of campus and I don't believe there's any research being done on them here now. Uh, they too have training, but it's animal specific or procedure specific. Now most of the research that's done is done with rats and mice. And oddly enough, the regulations exclude those breeds. But we have chosen here at ECU to be self-regulated, and so we have an outside agency come in and look at all animals used in research, look at all of our labs, look at all of the facilities where animals are housed, and it's accredited ECU their program, their use, their housing, and their care. Animal use and, and care is just that. The importance of the welfare of the animals is really paramount. So they're going to ask you to do research that can use a different model, a lower species model, or a computerized model, if at all possible. That's going to be one of the justifications you have to give them. The second is, can you use less numbers of animals and still get statistically significant? I said that. Usually I stumble all around that. Statistically significant information out of a smaller number of animals. And third, can you share animals? So if you're drawing blood from a, a rabbit or a mouse, can you draw enough blood in one stick that someone else in another lab can also use that blood so you don't have to stick the animal twice? Um, they look very carefully at euthanization. If you are doing something, uh, say a surgical procedure to an animal, can that animal, can you assure the committee that one, the animal will feel no pain, so you're going to anesthetize that animal appropriately so that there's no stress, no pain. Can you revive that animal to a level of quality of life? And you don't think of having animals having quality of life, but they do. Can you restore that animal's quality of life after the surgery, and if not, then what method of euthanasia will you use? And is it the most humane? I'll tell you something I learned because I did animal care as well as human subjects for 28 years. And <laughs> what we learned about midway through my career was that you should never euthanize an animal in a room full of animals. So in other words, if you've got to put down a mouse, take the cage that that mouse came from and they live in colonies somewhere else or take that mouse somewhere else before you euthanize them. Because they give off some kind of hormonal stress that gets the whole colony upset and then you've got a hundred crazy rats trying to get out of their cage and get at you. At least that's the way I felt. But, <laughs> so it, it, it is an evolving process with animals. We learn things every day. And the important thing is why are you using animals in research? The most important thing, obviously, is that it goes from bench to bedside. That's, that's the hope, is that the use of an animal model is really to move man forward in 
whatever kind of problem we're trying to solve. Questions so far? Yes. Would the taste testing, is that, uh, is that a part of animal research? It, it would have to go through both the eye cook at the, on the front end to change the diets of the two um, species, and then it comes to us for the taste testing. You have to control how you kill them. Um, but that's pretty standard. Um, they have, in fact, a, a recommended way of rendering the animal so that they don't feel the pain. It's it, it's a it's a fine line that we walk. When I first started in, in this business, I worked in veterinary science, and I specifically worked with uh, equine with horses. And being from Kentucky, part of what the University of Kentucky did was they served the horse farms and the racetracks. Uh, they did testing of the horses after races to make sure they hadn't been doped. But more so than that, they, they provided veterinary service for most of the race farms. And horses have this, because they've been so interbred, have this uh, genetic disease called wobbling. And it's where the muscles of the neck never develop sufficiently to hold the animal's head up. And so when the baby first stands up, it, it can't. It keeps falling over because the head is the largest and heaviest part of its body. So they would bring them to us to put down. And the easiest and most humane way to put those coats down was to shoot them. And I went berserk the first time I saw it. You know, it was like, that can't be the most humane way. You can give them sleeping pills or something. But come to find out there's something in their system that if you give them anesthesia, enough anesthesia to actually put them down, it's not like dogs and cats. They become very violent and they kick and they hurt themselves. And so in truth, shooting them is the most humane way to kill a horse. So. You learn something every day. You know, you can go home and say, I learned how to kill a horse. <laughs> what other questions do you have? Do, do we have a section for animals? Well, what I mean is that, um, are there categories of animals that don't fall under RIV approval? No, what you will, it, it's a separate track altogether. And you will go on to, um, you know, I don't, I think you can just put I A C U C. In under ECU IAC UC, and it'll come up, and it's a whole <coughs> different. They actually fall under the medical center, under Brody, and the rest of us fall under RTS, Research and Graduate Studies. I just wanted to to kind of hit on a couple of things that uh, Hiromi said. Authorship. You've got to get that in writing. Don't be someone else's workhorse only to end up not being mentioned in a publication. I don't know if any of you all have plans to go into academia, but it is what faculty live and die for. If you don't have publications behind you, you're not going to get tenure. You may not even get a job. So I always Whenever I was doing research with a faculty member, we sat down before I lifted the first test tube, and we had a draft agreement that said, this is how this is going to be played out. And that's probably what you need to do if you're going to use humans in submitting your application or animals in submitting your application. Find out if they want to be PI, you can bet they're going to want to be the author. So you need to have that all worked out. And the other thing that I wanted to stress is this conflict of interest. It's not saying you can't have a conflict. It is saying you just need to tell it. 
Third thing is about scientific misconduct. You all are going to do everything right. You may see something in a faculty member's actions or in a faculty member's um, writing that is not right. And you know it's not right. You have safeguards to come to us and tell us about it. And we will protect your identity as much as possible. Now, if you're the only one in the lab, they're going to know that it's somebody in the lab that's telling us. But even with that, we have whistleblower rights, which means nobody can touch you. There is no retaliation. Unless it is done in a manner that is uh, deceitful, if you're just having a personnel problem, then that's not the route to go. Go to HR. Don't file a scientific misconduct allegation. Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. Um, Question about let's see. Um, so my study <coughs> is a. Um, I'm a master's student in English, but um, so I'm conducting some surveys and interviews. So my study was exempt, and but I started to. Um, I think I clicked on. I'm not sure which um, question number it was, but no more than minimal risk. Well, I, I changed it uh, at some point back to exempt, but there was no more than minimal risk, but for some reason I thought I, it couldn't be exempt when I first began the IRB process. And then later I found out that it could. Isn't with an exempt and then, I'm sorry, but extradited. Thank you. Um, it's it also extradited, there's no more than minimal risk. Can correct. you explain the differences? Um, exempt actually is everyday life occurrences, pretty much. You know, we've all gotten phone calls. I just got one today about a survey for political party or something, and I said, "Do you have an IRB number? If not, I don't want to talk to you." And I hung up. And usually, pretty much cools their heels. Um, expedited is using humans in given situations that won't put them at risk of harm, such as blood draws from healthy individuals or, but it's not things that they would normally go through in life. Um, let's see, blood draws is one of them. The use of like a swab of saliva or a pulled tooth or um, you can use x-rays for a limited amount. So it, it's very non-invasive procedures that are usually <coughs> being done just for research. Whereas the others are things that are like the curriculum development, they go into the classroom and do things that are normal classroom practices. But I have to tell you, it, it was a federal decision. Those are federally defined categories. And they obviously didn't ask me because the line is very blurred in a lot of those situations. So what we do is we try to interpret and then we write out what our interpretations are. So when they come down and say, that's not the right interpretation, we can say, well, at least we made this interpretation and we followed it consistently in advising our investigators. And I have yet to get dinged for that. And we're not very conservative. We're very liberal on our, our determination. So that's a good conservative. <laughs> conservative is uh, there's a lot of institutions that have one IRB. And that is primarily medical. And you put something qualitative in front of physicians, and they think they're looking at outer space. You know, <laughs> I'm sorry, but they're very smart people, but they don't understand qualitative research. <laughs> so we're very liberal in the sense that we have our own social science behavioral IRB. It is led by social scientists. It has social science members. We do have two medical members on there. 
that serves on both boards. And it's a really well-rounded, non, like I said, non-conservative group, in my opinion. And sometimes they're so liberal that I kind of get nervous. And we have discussions, you know, before the reviews. But it's better that way than the other way. Yes. So if I were reporting um, a, a class, mm -hmm. um, so could that be an exempt application? No. If you're recording, video or audio recording, that is not considered exempt unless you record every class, you know, that's part of your classroom technique. Other questions? I had a quick one on uh, and mentioned before, but I always want to make sure this one, um, okay, passion ideas, mm -hmm. she said, I know here the website, and, and heard that, okay, they say, if, we, if I'm presenting an idea to a faculty member or a staff, then that can become the property of ECU um, versus, I guess, individual protection. Um, I'm just trying to understand, I mean, the, okay. the, the small yeah. way to go about it, because there's ideas I do have of researching different things, but first I was wondering, as a student, like we were saying about rights and things we might can oh, do, absolutely. if I could come kind of get private consultation, but then I was confused because then it was I said, well, if it went through and it became something major, then that would become a property of ECU. So I was uh -huh. that's partially right. Okay. If you have intellectual property, I would strongly advise you to go to their office, Mark Foley or Marty Van Scott, uh, and talk with them so that you've established it is in fact your idea. Then I would tell your mentor or your faculty advisor, whatever. But it's partially correct that because you will use ECU resources to carry out that intellectual property, they will own a portion of it, but not all of it. The majority of it will go back to you if, in fact, it becomes patentable or copyrighted. Um, patents cost about ten thousand dollars to file. Mm -hmm. ECU will do that for you. They absorb that cost. Mm -hmm. So the portion that they're getting back is to cover the resources that you use to uh, do your research, the patent filing, and all lawyer or legal processes that have to go forward. But you get the majority of I don't remember, is it 60-40, something like that? I'm, I'm not sure. I think it's 60-40. Thank you. Yeah. And, you know, all of us that do research here, ECU owns that research. That doesn't mean that when you leave, you can't take a copy of it with you. All it means is that we have to have it here to show in case there's an audit or the public wants to see what's been going on with their dollars. You can come, you can leave. We've gone over. <laughs> so I know um, you kind of covered this, but um, when, when this was first mentioned, I thought, now, why would a faculty member um, <clears throat> who isn't conducting research want to be listed as the PI? I mean, that, that that's actually very odd that this does occur. It does. So what would be the faculty member's reasoning for having, for wanting to be listed as a there, um, and I'm giving them the benefit of the doubt because I have never asked one straightforward. I, my thought is that they must think that they are providing the intellectual guidance. Isn't that, wouldn't that be the faculty uh, advisor? I'm not sure what that tab is for. It's right under the DI, what is it that the term, the tab? Well, and that's for those students who are listed as a PI. Right. So if, in fact, the faculty is going to be the PI, then you'll be listed as research personnel. There won't be anything in that. There will be the PS space for a sub-investigator? Why? Because the feds only recognize one person responsible for the research. 
And that may be another reason that faculty think they should be the PI because they do have the <coughs> institution behind them if there is a problem. But I don't buy either one of those, <coughs> quite frankly. If you're doing the work, you should get the credit. If you're doing the work and there's a problem, you should stand up and take whatever needs to be done. Uh, <coughs> you know, we're not going to let you get too far in trouble because we do a lot of oversight. So <coughs> you just it just depends on the faculty member. But we're changing the culture gradually. Yeah. Yes. Yes, this this goes <coughs> without saying the, the research has been conducted overseas. Um, I'm assuming the rules, legislation, whatever, still applies? Yes, because, and don't take this wrong, you belong to <laughs> us, and so we're held responsible for your actions regardless of where in the world that research is taking place. What we will do is ask you to provide documentation either from the site where you're doing research or the community or the village or the doctors or whatever you're doing over there. We need to know that they're aware that you're going in to do research, that they agree that the research can be done, and that you have a plan to sustain whatever it is you're doing over there after you leave. Because what we don't want to do is go in and offer them something for six weeks that really changes their lives in a positive way and then say, thanks, bye. You know, there's got to be something where you train someone with the skills that you have so that when you leave, that can carry on. In medicine, that's critically important. What avenues are these individuals going to have to obtain that same medicine after the research is gone? We don't want to use them as guinea pigs, in other words. Uh, that permission, that expert permission, does it, has, does it have to be, um, can it be at the project level? So if I'm, if I'm a, 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 an assistant on a research project and I'm conducting some analyses um, for, on that research, um, but the project has that documentation. Do I necessarily need separate? No, no, no. Okay. No. And my guess is you're going to be analyzing data that doesn't have any identifiers. It might. It might. Some with uh, uh, georeferenced data, uh, locations. And I, I just want to, what I would ask you to do is just give me a copy of your proposal or your protocol or his protocol. Let me read it and then I can better tell you what does and does not need to have. I, one thing I just thought of that Hiromi told me I would tell you all, you have to keep data for a minimum of three years. ECU has to keep data for a minimum of seven years. That's state law. So if you're leaving ECU, they need a copy of the data so they can meet their obligations. If it's private protected health information, you have to keep it six years. Is that confusing enough? We'll tell you all that when you come through. We'll help you with that. Thank you all very much. I appreciate it. Well, from 10 o'clock until 4 o'clock, and they came out and said uh, they're going to hold it over for a week because the, the judge wants more time to look at documents. And I was like, well, thank you. Thank you all so much. I have a bunch of your cards. I don't know how I got them, where I got them, but of course I didn't bring them tonight. Like business cards? Yeah. Uh. Well, this is telling me I need.